they were initially coming really really quickly but it has been so dry the poor plants are really really struggling now i'm just going to leave the hose on them for a bit but it's just been a bit tough for them actually that first lot were absolutely fine initially because um when i planted them out we still had that quite cool weather the second lot that i sowed and put out top bed i'll show you what they look like but they look very very sad they're so stunted and it's just been too dry we haven't been able to keep up enough watering you know to really get them established and they've suffered for it anyway i only really came up to do this today pick peas eat peas before i get them home and um i'm gonna put the tromboncino in do you see like this is the height of the other set of peas that i put in producing pods and i'll pick these in just a minute but like they have got nowhere near as tall. The other ones are, you know, up to here. And there wasn't a huge difference in time between. There was about four weeks between planting time. These lot just never really got going. But that's watering. But that's just, it was just so hot and so dry by the time these ones started to really settle in. Whereas the other ones had a little bit of cool, wet period. So they took off a lot better. Tromboncino, also known as Zucchetta, are actually quite an interesting beast. They are technically a winter squash and they grow in a winter squash kind of fashion, hence I'm able to grow them up and over this arch. So you know how, say, a courgette grows in, although they're quite sprawling, they're much more of a bush shape, whereas a winter squash or a pumpkin, these big, long, straggly tentacles that kind of just cover an entire patch. That's how these grow, which, like I say, means that I can grow them up over the arch as long as I tie them in. But although they are technically a winter squash, they're mainly eaten as a summer squash. So the fruit are very, very long. They look a little bit like a courgette, but with a bulbous end. And when picked to eat fresh, they're about a foot long, 30 centimeters long, something like that. And they are absolutely delicious. I grew them for the first time last year. They're a bit more pasty than a courgette, but really, really good flavor and a really nice texture like they hold themselves together a lot better than a courgette so you can put them in a stew where a courgette would maybe disintegrate the tromboncino keeps its structure and is really really tasty but then being a winter squash you can actually leave them to go on the plant to grow into a full size squash and then leave them to go hard over winter to cure them and we tried this with a couple last year so they got to about four foot long they were absolutely massive huge monsters and so we cured them. We ate one of them when it was sort of less than perfectly cured um, and it tasted of pretty much nothing. So we left another one to cure properly thinking that that might improve the flavor and it didn't. And I've since looked up and they are described as a bit of a watery butternut squash and I would agree, very little flavor really. Um, so we're not gonna be doing that again this year. I've got these three plants and they're going on the same arch as the bolotti beans because I didn't have a full arch of bolotti beans germinate but we've got enough so this is going to be bolotti bean and tromboncino archway and we're going to be picking all of them as summer squash we're not even going to bother letting any get big because it just wasn't worth it <laughs>
exciting. It is beautiful and it's actually really pretty early this morning um, because it has been so hot. It's been like 30, 31 ish. Really, really warm. And by the afternoon, like when I'd normally come up here, it is just too hot. So we're up here at 8 o'clock this morning. And it's bliss. The temperature is perfection. And uh, the main task of the day, hair in the face, main task of the day is watering and feeding, which includes sorting out the situation with the watering system in the polytunnel. It also means I've got a mixture of comfrey feed to feed things with and I also have my favourite, I don't know if you remember, the fantastic Shropshire seaweed, which I've got to say a huge thank you to them. I mean, I buy this anyway, um, but they sent me another free bottle of it which is excellent they also sent me like a super concentrate one which i haven't used yet but i know how to use this one, so i'm sticking with this one at the minute um but yeah so i get these uh refilled there's a place in teddington that does refills of this so and i'm constantly nipping in there to get some but yeah they sent me a free one which is the best <laughs> thank you very much shropshire seaweed these are the people you know i have that gray hat i'm like constantly doing sponsored by shropshire seaweed <laughs> all through the winter um i'm not sponsored by shropshire seaweed by the way i just excellent hat excellent feed um yeah so i've got some comfrey feed left over from last autumn i don't know if you remember right at the end of the season i just chopped all the comfrey down and bung it in a bucket ready for use this spring i thought i was going to be using it a lot earlier this year than i have been but we had such a slow start to the year i've only really sort of got my tomatoes in in the last two weeks haven't i so uh, yeah, I would have thought I would have been using it from about April. Hasn't worked out that way this year. So kind of starting the big feeding push now. I don't have any nettle feed though, but still. Uh, right, let's go and see if we can empty the water bar because the first thing I need to do before I get that um, watering system in the polytunnel sorted out is I need to empty the water that's already in the water barrel because we have to change the Hey Lily Malou. Lily is back. Uh, I was saying, I get a lot of comments about, oh, where was Lily this week? I didn't see her, but um, she's a love, but she's obviously, like she's a wild cat. She's, she's fickle. And somebody on a couple of plots over has uh, installed a treat pot of Dreamy's cat treats in their shed. And so they are now the priority allotment to go and visit. <laughs> so it's only when they're not there that we get the privilege of her company. I might have to install a rival pot of Dreamies. Allotment tension. <laughs> hey Lil. Pussycat, hey, it's all about the Dreamies, isn't it? It's all about the Dreamies for beautiful pussycat. Huh? She's so funny, you know, she feels so skinny after the enormous fluff of winter. You know, she got incredibly fluff. Look how slinky she is now. She's like, it's like she halves in size over the summer. Hey, beautiful pussycat. Hey. Hey, love. Hey, love, darling. How are you? Sweetheart. I need to get some dreamies, don't I? I do. I do. Not going to waste the water in the water butt, of course, uh, but it's just going to take me a lot of trips 
<laughs> filling up my watering can and distributing it. Once I've got an adequate amount of water out of this water butt, um, the first thing we're going to do is raise the whole thing up. So not really high, it's not gonna be on stilts or anything, but it just wants to be at the level of the beds that are inside the polytunnel where I want the water to run into. And then we're also going to move the tap. So this water butt, like loads of water butts, they have sort of options for where you can put the tap, which is sort of halfway up or right at the bottom. At the moment, we've got the tap halfway up because the barrel has been sat on the ground. But when we lift it up, we're going to swap that over so that the tap is at the very bottom of the barrel, which gives more water pressure from the water inside the barrel and also the height of it will let it drain quite naturally into the polytunnel. about a foot but that's all we needed and you can see where the tap has been swapped over from the midway point. Obviously the idea is to have it uh, filled with rainwater off the top of the polytunnel but uh, currently there's no such thing as rain in this part of the world. <laughs> so we're just filling it with uh, mains water straight out of the tap at the moment which will give it the weight because if we just leave it on there empty it's going to fall over and also it means that we can test out this watering system properly. While I'm waiting for the water barrel to fill up I'm just going to have a quick tidy of my tomato plants. So this string method, how you keep them taut is you just wind the center stem of the tomato around the string. So the string is pulled in the bottom of the planting hole. The roots of the tomato itself actually grip that string in. And then you just, sorry, I'm doing this with one hand. It should be two hands. It's normally a lot simpler than this. You just wind that string around the tomato plant. The winding of the string then keeps it taut. And also it provides a huge amount of support to the tomato plant rather than tying it on in places against a cane or something. You've got an entire spiral supporting the whole plant so it's much less likely to snap. But tip of the week is really do use two hands when doing this. You can see that it supports the stem the whole way up. So I'm going to take some cuttings of the tomatoes that are in the polytunnel at the moment. Unfortunately, um, mum is paranoid about me not doing the, um, taking the side shoots out and them becoming huge bushes. And so she whipped in there the other day and took a load of them out. She knew that I was going to save them, so she saved them all, but didn't actually list what variety, what plant they came off. So it's just a jumble of random tomatoes. <laughs> anyway, I've just been in there and have a look while I was winding them up and I've got five that are ready to come off. So I'm just going to uh, label five pots and stick them in there because Johanna is after some of these tomatoes. And then if I've got any extras, I can just give them away to whomever. So that is my next job. Um, so what do I need? Labels, I've got my pots. I really need to buy some more of those really big labels. Do you remember I've got like, um, I've got loads and loads of these little ones which will do for this but um, I have run out of the big labels. I need to remember to order them when I get home because I need them. Right let's go and take some tomato cuttings. Because tomatoes uh, produce root pretty much all the way up their stem you know if you bury them really really deep they just produce root up until the point that they reach the surface so taking cuttings from them is really easy and just take out the side shoots 
and stick them straight in the soil and nine times out of ten they will root without any rooting powder with no special treatment it's easy as okay sorry about the sweaty it is really hot in here but tomato cuttings uh from the side shoots so i know most of you grow a lot of tomatoes but for anybody who doesn't grow a lot of tomatoes they basically come in two types which is a bush or a cordon and the bush ones as you imagine kind of grow like a bush uh, but the other ones grow up in a long tall straight line and you have to take the side shoots out so that you get a really nice long tall plant with plenty of fruit on it and it's those side shoots that um, I'm taking off today and if you don't take them off you do end up with a huge tangled little, little long stringy mess of a tomato plant which you don't really want is impossible to tie up and uh, quite difficult to get the air to the fruit later on when they start ripening up so taking the side shoots off let me show you what they are so where you have your main stem coming up and each of the leaves coming off here you'll find you get a little thing like this coming out now if you let them get to this sort of size so that's one coming between the joint of the leaf and the stem this one is now perfect to take as a cutting and it's dead simple all you do snap it off you don't need anything exciting there it is and then you could just stick it straight in the compost i'm not kidding you just go straight in like that give it a water it will flop and look like it's not doing anything and then all of a sudden it will just start growing again generally the case do you remember when i was planting these out i snapped a bit off one of them um and i stuck it in a pot well it was looking terrible but now it looks like this so it was all flopped over but can you see it's just started like producing new leaf at the top there so that one is going to be good to go now i've just got to remember which plant that came off looking at my map i think it was dr green <laughs> one I've been a bit slow with this is the black beauty and it's got two leaders already so I'm gonna to have to take one of them out that's the problem when you leave those side shoots in just slightly too long the plant adjusts itself so that it ends up with two leaders instead of just the main one and a clear side shoot <laughs> which is what I've done here which is why mum is quite rightly so on it about taking them off because it makes it very very confusing to try and figure out what was the original leader but i think it's that one that needs to come off and if it wasn't the other bit is now the leader Okay, well, I've stuck them in here 
um, instead of uh, keeping them in the poly or leaving them outside just because um, I want to keep them out of direct sunlight and now we've got to the point where the sun isn't on the greenhouse anymore. It's lovely and cool in here so I've put them in here because otherwise they just dry out too fast before they've had a chance to take anything up or make any root of their own. Okay so next thing I'm going to feed the tomatoes in the poly tunnel and I'm going to feed them with my uh, Shropshire seaweed. Now I'm not great at getting the measurements right you know when it says 0.3% of your <laughs> should be I mean I know what it should be but kind of I'm not very good at estimating how much that is and up until this point I have not had any sort of measuring device so it's just been chucking a capful you know uh, but I actually um, you remember Annie my uh, cat who is no longer with us not Lily my home cat um, when he wasn't very well I was having to uh, feed him with uh, like a recovery mixture and I had to use a syringe. I was at home yesterday clearing out the drawer and I was like, I've still got the syringes. I was like, huzzah! I can use them to measure out the correct amount of seaweed to my water. So I, I think my watering can is 10 litres. So it should be pretty easy to work out. It is indeed 10 litres. And here is my... <laughs> Uh, measurer which is excellent in mils perfect and the rate is as such so I'm going to say for flowers I'm going to do them once a week and what is that going to be so 0.3% of a litre in that case is going to be three mil isn't it so if it's, it's going to be 30 mil so this is a 10 mil dripper so it's going to be three of these that makes it a lot easier. I think it slid back. Alrighty ho, 10 litres of water and three of these. Although, what? Say that was... It's got to be one mil. Yeah. I don't know if you can see me, the sun is so bright, I can't even see the screen, it's completely black. But a little bit of a flaw in my plan. So I thought this was 10 mil, okay? And uh, so I've put three of those in there. When I tipped it out into the lid, uh, it turns out it's only one mil. Because <laughs> there is no way that that two and a half times that is a standard shot as he just said. So I'm gonna to have to do 30 of those, which is less convenient than I thought. So what I'm gonna do is measure 30 of these out and see how much of this cap it fills. And then I'll just know that I could just put a cap in, if you see what I mean. Okay, well, that was a bit of a faff. Uh, and it turns out that uh, 10 mil is one whole cap off the bottle itself, which means I just need to put three caps in every time I fill this watering can up which is excellent. And I'm glad that I have actually finally taken the time to measure it out because I've just been winging it every time. And it turns out I've been underdoing it because I've just been doing a cap full in this watering can and I should have been doing three. So the question of why using seaweed feed? Well, basically seaweed feed has been around, I would say centuries, but it's gonna be millennia, raking the seaweed out of the sea to lay across the land as a fertilizer has been known about for an extremely long time shall we say and it's pretty much good for everything that's what's so fantastic about seaweed feed because one of the reasons is that you know how quickly seaweed grows well that is due to these hormones that are produced within the seaweed and when you make the seaweed feed out of them those hormones remain as a growth stimulant 
so they really really fire up the growth in the plant but when you buy like a big commercial chemical based mpk fertilizer it's got a very limited range because it's gone for exactly what the plant needs as macronutrients the mpk value of the fertilizer whereas one of the most exciting things about seaweed feed particularly a pure seaweed feed like this one from shropshire seaweed is that there's the most vast range of the micronutrients also contained within it so they improve the entire soil system around it and they give the plant all of those other little tiny bits of things that they need rather than just a big whack of the macronutrients that that they're going to need to grow so basically it's just absolutely fantastic stuff for all round soil and plant health. I just think it's fantastic. And particularly, I'm particularly fond of the Shropshire seaweed. I mean, for a couple of reasons. Firstly, they make fantastic hats. <laughs> but also, like they use nothing but seaweed. There's nothing else added to it. It's totally pure. It's a really great company. I like their general ethos. And also, I love the fact that I can get my bottles refilled. I don't have to keep reordering it. You know, I can just go in there with a milk jug and fill it up. And yeah, I am a big oh. Shropshire seaweed fan. Are you small pussycat? Are you small? Are you small girl? Are you little hen? Do you want to see some breakfast? Huh? Do you want some breakfast? Some breakfast? Yeah, I think so. Do you go get some? Where's your bowl? Now, do you remember that we were leaving our field beans out to try and attract the ladybirds? Well, once again, it has worked a treat. Look at all the young ladybirds on here. It's absolutely smothered in them. <laughs> I'm so pleased this seems to be a really consistent way of attracting ladybirds to the plot. Absolutely brilliant. A fertilizer, it's a crop and it's a ladybird uh, attraction mechanism. <laughs> And like I say, also a crop. So this year we managed to fend off the black fly on some of these lower beans and we picked some for the first time the other day. Okay, so they're tiny, they're more pea-sized, the broad beans inside, but my goodness are they delicious. I mean, these ones up here, by the time they've got a bit higher up the plant, they've got no chance of developing into pods because the black fly have just gone crazy. But they were absolutely delicious. So basically, yay for field beans all round. Now, if I can tear my way from looking at these immature ladybirds, the polytunnel water butt is now full, so we can go and test out that watering system. Okie dokie, so we have swapped over the tap so that it's actually got a proper, like, you know, debris, so that connects to it nicely now. So this can either connect to our mains water hose or can go in there for slow drips. It's gonna be kind of twofold. If I turn that on, you can see it coming out. I mean, I need to unbury this because it's got a bit stuck, but you can see like at this point here, it's coming out and that is almost at the end of the run. And it's really kept the moisture up in here. And that's sort of the point of it. So, you know, we've had this terrible trouble with the place, in, the soil in here just completely drying out to the point where it becomes like hydrophobic. And then you can't get the water back in and things really, really suffer. It doesn't seem to matter how much you water it. It just never absorbs into the compost. So this is our plan to stop that. So it's twofold. The fact that it's coming off the water butt means we can just have a really slow trickle in here and keep the ground with a bit of moisture in it, even when it gets really, really hot. And then we can always blast the holes. So because it's lying on top of the compost, likelihood is, because I've just pierced the holes all along the side of the hose, like the mud and the compost and things will get inside it. So we can also stick the 
uh, mains water hose on there to give it a good old blast through so that will clear the holes out um, also we can give it really good proper water then but basically this is our we've solved the watering issue thing so yes small scale raging success i'm really pleased he's just fiddling with the hose but it's coming out at the level of the top of the bed so it's just flowing out really nicely um, all of the back section where i've made the holes the pressure is really good it's having an actual proper trickle all the way to the end um, which is just brilliant it's exactly what i wanted and this front section so far i haven't made any holes in it yet hence it's you can see the difference between it being damp at the back and dry at the front but when i get my peppers in i will i will make some strategically placed holes across there and yeah still a lot of lettuce well, now that's out the way and the tomatoes are sorted, I'm gonna do a bit of clearance. Unfortunately, the perpetual spinach has met its end. It's all bolted, it's too hot for it. So it's time for it to come out. Okay, well, while uh, fertilizer <laughs> is featuring so heavily in this week's vlog, this is my comfrey tea. Now this stuff stinks and it is from last autumn. That's when I made this. Oh, it's formed a really nice, disgusting skin on top. Wow, that pongs. But okay, so what is comfrey tea good for? Um, it's a really good one to use in conjunction with the seaweed because where the seaweed has all of the micronutrients and the growth stimulant, what the comfrey has is really good MPK value. Plants themselves have these incredibly deep roots and they bring up and absorb the nitrogen and the phosphorus and the potassium and they bring it up into the plant on top and make it a much more bioavailable form. So whereas you're making the tea with it is a liquid fertilizer. It's also a fantastic chop and drop fertilizer where you just put, you know, scatter the leaves on and put them under mulch or whatever. Or you can put them in the bottom of beds as you're building them, stick them in the compost. It's just excellent stuff. We used to have one of our raised beds entirely dedicated to comfrey on the plot, but slowly it got infested with cooch grass and because they are a permanent perennial, it just became very difficult to get it out. So we ended up moving them around. We've got a big patch next to the pond. We've got a big patch out here, or a couple of patches out here along the path that we use. It's a fantastic plant in the sense that it is so easy to grow and it's actually really quite beautiful. You'll find it growing wild really easily. It's all over the place and it's got these really distinctive furry back leaves that are quite knife shaped. They're quite long and slender. It can easily be confused with green alkanet, which is also everywhere, but they're a much brighter green and they're much wider at the base and become narrower. The easiest way to tell the difference is when they're flowering is that the comfrey has those pretty little purple bells and the green alkanet has like a blue, almost like a forget-me-not flower. While we're talking all things fertilizers, uh, another one you can make yourself is nettle tea. We've got a lot of nettles growing along this edge, along with the comfrey. And nettle tea, you make the same way as the comfrey tea, but it's a very, very good early season fertilizer because it's very high in nitrogen. Temperature is seriously rising now. It's about 11, so I think it's probably time to go home. But we have put the girls out into the fruit cage, so they've got a bit of excitement. Of something new and they can do the weeding for us <laughs> um 
This is the first time we've put this set of girls into the fruit cage. We used to do it like a long time ago with our other girls and they were very, very well trained because they were much more free range than the ones we've got now. And we used to just be able to shake the tin and they would come running. In fact, if I can find the footage of mum doing that, I will put it on. Now the problem is, is we've got to get these girls who are not well trained down back into their house. Catching them might be an issue. Hey girls, how's your holiday been? How's it been? Have you done lots of weeding? You have. Lots of weeding. Ah! Yeah, I know girls. Right, are you ready to go back down? Are you going to cooperate? Probably not. another ferociously sunny day and uh, I am in the polytunnel for as brief a time as possible so I'm just gonna assess what's going on with the watering system so we left it on last night it has drained that top section of the barrel uh, so about halfway down and uh, you can see quite clearly like the moisture pattern let me show you so you can see actually I don't know if it's picking up on the camera but you can see it's very very damp all underneath the tomatoes where the squiggly line is actually you can see it quite clearly in this corner bearing in mind that the reason that i wanted to put this watering system in here was because we've had all those problems previous years with the soil just drying out so much that then it gets to the point where it won't take on any more water so what this is specifically here to alleviate is to just make sure that we can keep a minimum level of moisture in here at all times like rather than coming in and doing like a 20 minute really try and soak the thing, just by having a slow drip that we can keep when it is really hot, just to try and try and stop that happening. And I think it's gonna be really successful. It's not the kind of watering system that I would put like on a timer or a watering system. Like I used to put watering systems in uh, on roof gardens, in which case you have a, a mains water tap, you have a timer, it goes off. To be fair, we could probably do that on our mains tap here apart from the fact that other people have to use the tap so I wouldn't be able to leave it connected all the time uh, because then that's not fair but if we could leave it connected then I probably could because they're battery operated but that's not really what this watering system was about it was about just trying to keep it above that bare minimum where it just kind of dries out completely and then we're really really stuck so this is exciting we have cherries slightly alarmed that they're going red and we haven't got any protection on them yet uh, <laughs> because the birds are going to be all over this although i tell you what just saying this on our way up this morning we used to have so many squirrels in fact you saw them in the background like fairly recently well when we we're walking up here you know like the long pathway that we walk up that's kind of covered with ivy normally you're walking up there and they're leaping across wee, wee, wee. you know as they're kind of like flying out of the school and right now haven't seen any about two weeks, not a single one. Which is a bit of a worry. I worry that the school has poisoned them uh, because they were being a bit of a nuisance to them. They kept going through the big 
you know, the big wheelie bins and like hunting for sandwiches and throwing out bits of school dinners. So they were causing a bit of a mess, but I hope they haven't just killed them all. We haven't seen any, not a sausage. Okay, I'm gonna do a bit of sewing. I have got uh, pak choy to go in, which uh, normally if you sew pak choy at this time of year, it bolts because it's getting so hot. But I found that the red one doesn't seem to bolt. So I'm having a go with that. Also putting in some komatsuna, which I tried last year, didn't really work out, but uh, I'm gonna get another go because that's what you do, isn't it? <laughs> and I've also got red chicory and green chicory, which is the leaf style chicory rather than um, the hearting one. It's the ones that grow kind of like the big tall dandelions. So I'm gonna get some of those in. And also the other thing which I'm going to try, which I'm so late doing because I tried some when Johanna first gave me the seed. This is Caucasian spinach, which is a climbing spinach. Um, do you remember that I bought the, um, now what was it called? Malbar. Do you remember that I bought Malbar spinach after seeing it at Kew Gardens? Did I find the seed again? No, I did not. So this year we do not have Malbar spinach. I bought the green variety and the red variety. They've just disappeared. They've completely vanished. So that's going to be a job for next year. I'll probably find it at the end of the summer. Um, but I got this other spinach from Johanna. And I sowed some of these when she gave them to me or just a little bit after when she gave them to me and nothing happened. <laughs> but I did sow them into some pretty rubbish compost, uh, which I've later discovered um, has really hampered the germination of a lot of things. And I just had a couple of those seeds left in that packet. Luckily, I didn't sow them all when she gave them to me. So I'm going to throw some of them into. I know it's late. I might get something. You never know. So I'm going to sit down and do that. And then, chaps then I think it is time to head home because the temperature, it's not so much the temperature actually, I'm, I'm, that's not true. We've not got blue skies today, it's like grey, but you can feel the thunderstorms are brewing and we're due to have thunderstorms for like the next three days and the humidity, it's just like walking through soup basically, warm soup. I'm going to sow these, I'm going to go home, I'm going to go and vegetate in the garden. That's my plan. chaps we appear to have got through a whole week without any more technical difficulties having said that <laughs> uh, I've been trying to record this end bit for a good hour or so um, we've had plot neighbors coming onto the plot to have a chat while I've been trying to record we've got the school kids came, then then everybody cleared off and I was ready to go cheers and then all the school kids came out for end of day and then that was a nightmare and now i was just about to sit outside in the sunshine and say cheers to another week and suddenly it starts blowing a gale uh it's meant to be stormy this afternoon again so it's doing this thing where we get like really really hot day really humid and then it bursts into a thunderstorm at night which is lovely but currently it's the windy bit where it's all coming in so it's all blustery and hot and humid at the moment mm. But talking of um, technical difficulties, I uh, found something quite nifty the other day. I mean, completely out of my price range. There's no way I'm gonna end up with an Apple Watch. But 
I was in the pub the other day. Shock horror. I know, you're all amazed. <laughs> but um, I met up with a friend of mine and he was showing something extremely uh, nifty on his watch that he could... Um, so you know I keep having this difficulty that I can't tell if the camera's filming or not, or indeed what it's filming because it's facing the other way. Um, well, he had on his watch, he could set his like camera up over there. Actually, I'll just show you. I'll just show you. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's always like resting up against the lamppost or something. Where's it? So, um, the benefit of uh, hello YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> I think I did that last time. I tried to on camera. Right. So, so yeah, lap on your phone so you can like got my camera popped in one way. There's that. You can see, but it's also on my watch. So if I go this way. <laughs> This is my hand. Yeah, you see, that's that's pretty impressive. It, it is, yeah. It's very, yeah. It's very useful it when you're vlogging alone. I recommend it. <laughs> so yeah, that was pretty merry and uh, quite intriguing. But like I say, completely out of my price range. So we're not going to be upgrading to that system, chaps. <laughs> but what else? was I going to say? Yeah, a bit, a bit of a strange week this week. I did a lot of talking, it seems. Um, and what I really wanted to be doing was a lot of sewing. <laughs> so I got bit in, obviously. I got a little bit of sewing done. Um, but I do need to do carrots. I can't believe I still haven't done the carrots. So that's going to be the first thing on my list next week. Um, I went to pick up some more um, mulch compost, you know, the horse manure um, this morning. Oh, seems like ages ago. <laughs> It was only this morning uh, and they were having like the remnants of a plant sale there and what happened to be there was two very fine looking uh, Cape gooseberries so I'm gonna get them in this week so I've got to find a place for them uh, it's gonna be a lot of sewing and doing and having a bit of a look around and picking stuff next week because uh, we've got broad beans coming out of our ears so I need to pick some more of those they have been so good this year so good this year Bit of clearing as well actually because uh, the spinach is bolted so I need to sow some more of that. Yeah, it's just one of those constant at the moment. But I, knew, I don't know why this turned into a whinge. It wasn't meant to be, I was just gonna say cheers. <laughs> so anyway, cheers chaps. Happy Monday to the marvellous Monday Clubbers uh, who are listed at the end of this video. Uh, if you're wondering who they are, they are my Patreon supporters. That's what I got a question um, in the comments last week. What's the Monday Club? It is the people who incredibly kindly support me on Patreon week in, week out. Excellent chaps. They get their video on Monday, which is why they're called the Monday Clubbers. <sighs> I know, genius. <laughs> um, and everybody else, if it's Tuesday or if it's any other day in the week, uh, cheers. And I will see you next time for episode one, six, eight.